In the beginning, his name was not John William King. Born November 3, 1974, in a suburb of Atlanta, Georgia, the baby boy was named for his biological father, a man he would never know. After a nasty split, the baby's mother left him with close friends in another state. It was understood by all parties that the arrangement was temporary. By the time the little tyke was three months old, it was clear that he belonged with the kings. They offered stability, loved the child deeply, and were able to persuade the birth mother to give him up. The father showed more reluctance, especially since the child bore his name. Eventually, he was persuaded to sign away parental rights. For Ronald and Jean King, who lived in Picayune, Mississippi, with their other three children, it was a time to rejoice. They renamed the child John William King. He completed their family of two daughters and now two sons. It did not bother the couple that many years separated the smallest king from his three siblings. The sister closest in age was already 16 years old. With all the legal paperwork set, the proud parents finally took little John to court when he was about nine months old. His patriotic red, white, and blue shoes captured the attention of everyone. John was a beautiful baby, a blessing sent just for them. A judge's signature made the boy a legal and permanent member of the King household. When the child was nearly two, Ronald King left Mississippi and moved his family to a small southeast Texas timber town. In fact, the home where John would run and play was right near Louisiana Pacific, where his father secured employment as a millwright. John, soon nicknamed Bill, got along with children of all races. The neighborhood where the Kings lived was integrated, one of many selling points that made Jasper a more tolerant community than most of its East Texas neighbors. Folks worked and lived together, side by side, well aware that subtle racism existed mostly in economic terms rather than cultural barriers. One of his closest friends was a little black kid from the neighborhood. Bill King was considered a bright boy who did well in school. By all accounts, the quiet child seemed to soak up knowledge. There was nothing unusual about his upbringing. He not only received an ample amount of love and attention from his aging parents, he also enjoyed the affection of surrogates. His older sisters got along great with him, sometimes acting more like fussy young mothers instead of siblings. His brother had already left home, but he too doted on the family pet. There was no doubt that John William King was deeply loved. Oh, sure, I spoiled him. His father now reflects. I woke up telling him every day how much I loved him. The frail voice breaks. The elder king recalls how his son had one friend in particular that he was just crazy about. The friend was black. Nothing in his background jumps out as preparation for a child who would grow up to become a diehard white supremacist accused of a horribly violent crime. Oh no, I loved him to death and was proud to take him out in public. King sadly states. One of the best memories King has of his son was his lack of annoyance over displays of affection. He was never embarrassed about being hugged. He believed in showing us that he loved us. A religious foundation in the Baptist Church kept the younger King grounded and in touch with his salvation. As a well-mannered kid, he did the normal things boys in a small town were expected to participate in church, school, and sports. He was the kind of teenager who could be a role model for any teen. You'd want to show him off to anybody. The proud father reminisces. But he says his wife and daughters kept certain mischievous incidents about the boy from him. His eldest, a grown son in the military, warned him not to spoil the family baby. King says he later discovered there were little things his son was accused of, like broken windows and skipping school. For the most part, he chalked it up to sowing a few wild oats. After all, his son wasn't so different from other boys he ran around with. They were all the benefactors of clean living and hard-working parents. His was a lifestyle consistent with that of a country boy. 
King insists that Bill knew his personal views on race and respect, for he not only taught the teenager right from wrong, he demonstrated fairness and equality by the company he kept. Ronald King boasts of having close black friends and two black goddaughters that his son knew about. He did not mention to his son, however, that another family member once also stood trial for a hate crime, long before the term entered the legal lexicon. In 1939, Ronald King's older brother and another man were accused in the murder of a 49-year-old traveling salesman in another state. King's brother and co-defendant used as their defense the man's alleged sexual preference. They claim he made a pass and attacked them upon being rejected. The two men were never convicted. King is adamant that the full story was only unearthed because he shared the basic facts with a reporter who, in turn, betrayed his trust. Unhappy that his entire family continues to be measured by something that happened when he was just a child, King blames himself for making what he believed were off-the-record comments. He explains that in his brother's version of the story, as it was told to him, when they left the victim, he was alive. They had all been fighting. Other things were printed, broadcast, and repeated about King in the aftermath of the James Byrd Jr. murder. Things, he says, are not totally accurate. Some of the Jasper locals interviewed by FBI agents were once employed at the same lumber mill as Ronald King. A couple of former co-workers told authorities it was not uncommon to hear King use racial slurs as a younger man. More disturbing was an allegation that King openly bragged about membership in a Mississippi Klan group before moving to Jasper more than 20 years ago. A weary King denies any truth to the story that he once belonged to the Klan adding, there were plenty of others to rebut what was said by just two people. He is not exactly sure why former co-workers sullied his name. It doesn't bother me that they were telling lies to investigators about my past and about comments I didn't make. It was something they felt they had to do. At 67, King is in a wheelchair fashioned with an oxygen pump he must keep with him at all times. Prior to the trial, he almost never used the chair. Constant stress, his emphysema, and the probing investigation into his private life now demand he use it daily. When John William King lost interest in his education, trouble became his tutor. A few odd jobs around town could not hold his interest either. First, he was caught breaking some windows at an industrial facility near his home. Jean King paid for the damage without alerting her husband. Other things were also shielded from the man who calls his son the most loved boy he knew, his favorite child. In 1992, things plummeted downhill for the younger King. When he was 16, the only mother he had ever known died. What he didn't know was that Jean King's brother had once married a woman with a daughter from a previous relationship, that daughter, though no blood relation to the family, was John William King's biological mother. He had no contact with her, and now he had lost the one woman he truly loved. With the tender barrier between King and his father gone, a once hidden side came to light. The teenager was caught burglarizing a building. Suspended for dipping, chewing tobacco, the tenth grader chose to pursue adventures that kept him connected to friends with whom he had more in common. At 17, King and a new running buddy, Sean Allen Berry, were arrested with a third accomplice and charged with breaking into a building. In the fall of 1992, Berry and King were sent to Sugarland, Texas, boot camp. Ninety-day sentences actually seemed to help both. King's father remembers that he would sit outside the courthouse, waiting for a son to report to his probation officer. To keep tabs on the young burglar, state officials assigned him ten years of mandatory probation meetings. At the time, the elder King didn't realize that many of those planned dates were simply skipped by a clever kid who would just dodge around the courthouse, then appear again in time to facetiously exit. While King believed his son was special, Others saw nothing extraordinary except the great speed and determination with which he ran down the wrong path. 
it led straight to the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, TDCJ, and a notoriously violent state prison unit called Beto One. After King violated the terms of his probation, he earned an unwanted promotion to Beto in June 1995. As Ronald King struggles with a degenerative condition and all the medication he must take, including methadone and morphine, his heart continues to break for a boy he cannot save or find the will to abandon. You've got whatever kid you get, he coughs in between gasps for air. You don't stop loving them. True to his philosophy, King accepted his son with open arms and few questions when the young man returned to Jasper in 1997 after two years in Beto. King says he never liked all the tattoos his son came home with, but was told it was just part of some culture the newly muscular stranger studied while in prison. According to TDCJ records, King did switch his religious affiliation from Baptist to Odinist, something he never took the time to fully explain or define for his father, who remains confused about its theological origins. Before Vikings converted to Christianity, many believed Odin was the all-powerful god of battle, wisdom, knowledge, and poetry. Odin was the father of a more popular god, Thor, ruler of strength, whose symbol was the hammer. Odinism supports the theory that warriors must be prepared for one final battle against evil that will ultimately end in the destruction of the world. They believe it is an honor to die in such a battle. The old man did not completely understand the spiritual conversion, nor the external one that accounted for black ink all over his son's physique. Rebel flags, a swastika, lightning bolts, and terms such as Aryan pride dumbfounded the elder king. He could not fathom what prompted the decision to get so many, including a baby Jesus with horns. His son no longer resembled the small, shy kid who weighed only 140 pounds when he left home. King admits he was disturbed at first, but nothing could overshadow the joy he felt at the return of his son. For a time, things seemed normal. John William King convinced his father that the racial tattoos were nothing more than prison art, something he had done to show how proud he was of the white race and his new religion. Behind bars, King attained some computer skills. He had already earned a GED from Angelina College before his stint in state prison. He even talked about a job where he could work outdoors, perhaps put a talent for construction work to good use. A few job applications later, King reconnected with Barry, the best friend who had answered none of the four letters he wrote to him from prison. Helen Brewer is a very religious woman. She spent her life teaching three sons and two daughters the difference between right and wrong. For many of their formative years, the petite brunette was left alone to serve as both mother and father. Her military husband, Lawrence, was stationed at foreign bases for more than a decade. No one will ever know how much of an impact the absence had on the Brewer child, named for a heroic father with whom he never got the chance to bond. When the senior Brewer briefly returned, the family moved to Cooper, Texas. The reunion didn't last long. Another tour of duty swept the career serviceman abroad, and he was off again. When the head of the family finally returned to the States, the Brewers packed up and relocated to Kentucky, where they lived only a year. Finally, the Army veteran retired and moved his family to Klondike, Texas. Settled now in Sulphur Springs, Texas, it is beyond difficult for the broken-hearted mother to understand how one of her five offspring could possibly stand accused in the dragging death of another woman's son. Devastated, she tells the Associated Press, I couldn't do a dog that way. That just shows you what alcohol can do. From the time her son, Lawrence Russell Brewer, was born in 1967, Mrs. Brewer always did the best that she could by her second child and all her precious charges. Money was tight, and life at a bleak army base was tough. She was, in fact, 
a lonely wife with only a ring and five children to show for the union. Out of necessity, the married woman functioned more like a single parent scraping by on government paychecks. All the years Helen Brewer spent holding down the fort with five young children, she was a kind and loving mother who worked long hours to nurture and train. She raised her children to know God and did an admirable job under the circumstance of desperately missing a much-needed husband. So long without him, the permanent return proved a difficult transition. Like his mother, Lawrence Russell Brewer, called Russell by friends and family, is small in stature and shy. Both exhibit timid personalities. Having a larger-than-life father, built like a locomotive and nearly six feet tall, was intimidating for the boy, who was sure he would never measure up to the decorated Vietnam War veteran. Still... He tried to get to know his father, to please him. Instead of Dad and his namesake making up for lost time, the elder brewer apparently ruled with an iron fist. There was tension and the minor problems associated with adjustments to life with a wife and five children. Doug Barlow, who would eventually take over as the defendant's lead attorney, knew from his close work sessions with the family that Brewer was a strict disciplinarian, but Barlow says there was also another side. From what I know, he was a compassionate, sincere, and caring man. The Beaumont-based attorney believes Brewer's military training probably meant he expected others to toe the same kind of line. Indeed, a certain toughness in the senior Brewer revealed that sorry excuses or weakness would not be tolerated. All of the Brewer children were described as good while they were growing up including Russell, who was extremely protective of his mother. In court records, Helen Brewer agrees with the assessment and expands it to include her spouse as a good daddy, who, according to her later testimony, drank some on the weekends. After her husband's 20-year military career ended, Brewer continued to be a solid provider, affording his family the comforts of a middle-class environment. Despite better economic conditions, at age 12, Russell needed guidance. His mother steered him toward positive activities. He sang in the church choir, played with friends, and had the love of his siblings and other relatives once the family settled again in Texas. But he started experimenting with drugs as a teenager. Like King, Brewer had childhood friends of all races and lived in a mixed community. No one thought Brewer academically gifted. Suffering from low self-esteem and fear of the unknown, he started skipping school. His dad soon found out. At 14, Brewer was kicked out of the house and not allowed back. The senior Brewer, afraid that his other children might be corrupted by a wayward sibling, would not take the chance their brother might influence them to dabble in drugs or skip school. Homeless and afraid, Brewer turned to new teachers with unsavory street resumes. He dropped out of Cooper High School. No matter what he did, Brewer could always convince his mother to help him out with spare change, food, and clothes. Even with secret support from a loving mother, he had to abruptly leave whenever his father showed up because the eviction could never be lifted. A difficult parental decision, it was meant to teach Brewer to grow up and become a man. The snap judgment haunts the elder Brewer today, as he can't help but wonder if things might have turned out differently had he continued to provide a roof for his son to live under. Desperate to support himself and his growing drug habit, Brewer demonstrated a willingness to change. He did odd jobs. At 17, he returned home and joined the National Guard. Fleeting admiration over the manly decision gave Brewer a small shot of confidence. But other habits continued to whisper his name. The drugs is what led him astray. His mother would later testify. Brewer sunk so low that he targeted the homes of family and friends to burglarize. As he stole, a lot of sympathy for him evaporated. No matter how far astray he went, Brewer could always return to the loyal mother who consistently encouraged him to do better. When his strict father was at work or out running errands, Brewer sporadically returned like a beggar at the back door of his former home. 
Helen Brewer would later recall a conversation in which her son was so distraught he cried, Which way, Mama? Which way do I go? As she is known to do, the righteous woman advised her son to read the Bible to find an answer. Certain bright spots in his life made it seem that Brewer would not give up on himself. He got his GED from East Texas State University in Commerce. Brewer also held a few jobs, though none for very long. It was a feeble attempt to show critics who cast him off that they were wrong. Unfortunately, other stuff kept getting in the way of Brewer's efforts to redeem himself. That other stuff became part of a disturbing record the state of Texas began to document. In October of 1986, Brewer was sentenced to seven years probation for a burglary in Cooper. Not quite a year later, he was arrested in July on the same charge. Because Brewer violated the terms of his probation, he was briefly sent to prison. It should have taught him a lesson. In early 1988, Brewer was paroled to Cass County. Old habits gave chase. When authorities slapped the cuffs on Brewer in March 1989 in Snyder, a marijuana charge netted him ten days in county jail. Chance after chance, Brewer could not seem to function in the outside world. On April 28, 1989, the small-time burglar and drug user finally hit the big time with a 15-year prison sentence for cocaine possession. Brewer swore to his family the drugs, at least in that case, were not his. He agreed to take the rap because the man he was living with was doing drugs. Paroled two years later, Brewer made more attempts to turn his shattered life around. In one lockdown, Brewer went through a rehab program. He sought more meaningful employment to make something of his life and support a new family. In 1993, Brewer married a Hispanic woman from Fort Worth named Sylvia Nunez, the mother of his infant son. They hardly enjoyed a honeymoon at all. His parole was revoked later that year. Brewer was immediately sent to the Beto One unit of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. The odds were no longer in his favor. Brewer entered prison under the worst possible conditions that a white man can. Being an attractive, small, nonviolent offender with an unassuming personality. Born two days before Valentine's Day in 1975, Sean Allen Berry's childhood was hardly sweet, and the hand he was dealt hardly fair. Although born in Jasper, Berry and his family lived a stone's throw away in Kirbyville. Around age three, Berry's spirited young mother, Kathleen, took off. Neither parenthood nor marriage could fully tame the adventurous personality Barry had always heard stories about. Though Barry was raised by grandparents, a grandfather and step-grandmother, the man his mother had married continued in the role of father to young Sean. In 1990, Barry moved back inside Jasper City Limits to live with his maternal grandmother, Faye Barry. As a child, he had flourished in his country boy status, his grandparents had a large fowl farm where he could keep busy with lots of work and wide open space. They had chickens, cows, and a few horses. Deer and other game coexisted in nearby woods that Barry loved to run through. He was a rugged child who participated in just about every sport school had to offer, except basketball. Barry thought he was too short to master the sport of hoops, but he reveled in football, track, and anything else athletic. Like a lot of adolescent boys, his sports career began with Little League Baseball. Preferring the outdoors to the inside of a classroom, Barry nevertheless tried hard to build mental skills and master school. But eventually, education seemed a waste, taking time that could be spent doing more productive things. While he lived in Jasper, Barry continued to go to school in Kirbyville. Barry grew up well-loved and nurtured in what he considered a normal environment. But what happened in 1990 can hardly be classified as a regular family occurrence. Donald Hobson, the man Barry considered to be his father, committed suicide on a secluded patch of land owned by his family. Today, a daughter owns the property off Huff Creek Road, just before the old bridge that bedecks the same creek and predominantly black neighborhood where Barry used to swim and play. 
It is located right near an old dirt road they all used to walk down. The same one on which James Bird Jr. would end up chained to the back of Sean Barry's truck. Barry was crushed. Hobson, the man his young mother loved before she hit the road for Alabama, was the only father he had ever known. Barry knew who his biological father was, but had never met him. In Barry's mind, his real daddy was gone. First, a woman who gave him life abandoned Barry when he was a toddler for whatever selfish reasons. Then, a man he deeply loved shot himself. No matter what he did, Barry could not keep his head up. Barry's spirit, along with any desire to remain in school, was broken. When Barry's grandmother was away at work, he would skip school. Behavior problems and low self-esteem did not afford the boy a wealth of choices. Before ninth grade, Barry called it quits and never looked back. Faye Barry vigorously lectured her grandson about the merits of a good education and the potential it would bring for a decent future. Barry would listen, let her believe he was in school, and go straight to work. To the 15-year-old, work was way more important than what some stuffy old school books had to teach. With no experience necessary, Barry got his first job at Church's Chicken. In school, and on the job, Barry counted black people among his slew of friends. He was the life of the party wherever he went, and comfortable enough with blacks that a few from the baseball team once spent a night at his house. His grandparents raised Barry to understand the meaning of equal treatment for all. Barry's social circle grew when he got a second job sacking groceries at the HEB pantry. There was nothing left over once his grandmother paid bills, the rent, and scraped up enough cash for food and clothes. Barry did not want to depend on her totally, because he felt old enough to carry some of the weight. They were poor, but proud. Barry knew that if he wanted things beside the necessities, he'd have to find better-paying jobs than churches or HEBs. For the first time since Hobson's suicide, things for Barry looked up a bit. He became a jack-of-all-trades, dabbling in construction and concrete work. Aggressive and willing to prove his manhood, Barry sometimes worked seven days a week. Grown-ups say he was a quick study who mastered all types of skills. William Sparks, the man who eventually became Barry's longtime probation officer, remembers his reckless charge often wore two faces. He was something of an enigma. He had a good work ethic and likable personality, but couldn't stay out of trouble. In his free time, Barry liked to do what a lot of country boys did, ride around and raise cane. Barry's reputation came to the attention of law enforcement early. They knew about the regular brawls and other juvenile behavior. One woman recalls how Barry and his brother Lewis would ride around to case the town. Any misdeed or trouble was nearly always preceded by a joyride, something to break the monotony. One night, Barry was just out riding around town in his car, shooting the breeze over the CB radio. Everybody had gone CB crazy, with the good buddy 10-4 lingo utilized by truck drivers and made popular in country songs. Barry was having some technical problems when he heard a confident voice over the CB airwaves who bragged that he could fix radios. The anonymous teen gave Barry directions to his house. He went straight over. Instantly impressed with a large home-based system, Barry watched the new friend talk up a storm on his CB radio. True to his word, the young man repaired Barry's radio on the spot. To Barry, 16 at the time, John William King seemed far wiser than his 17 years. Sparks recalls how Barry was completely enamored. There was something about King that drew Sean to him. They were different. Bill couldn't stay focused on anything, but Sean would stick with something. I don't know what he saw in King. Maybe it was wine, women, and song. Whatever it was, the pair immediately started to hang out together. For a time, they were inseparable. Some even say they were best friends. It didn't take long for good times to turn into bad memories. Barry's older brother, Lewis, had also met King through a mutual friend. Sometimes, Barry lived with his brother, which is where he was the night King and another friend casually dropped by. With nothing else to do, Sean Barry left his brother behind to go riding with his two buddies. 
Minutes later, Barry was listening to plans to burglarize a machine shop where King worked. Someone had purposely left the back door to the building open. All they had to do was go in and take what they wanted. They settled on cigarettes. Instead of saying no, or just getting out of the car, Barry not only rode along, he went inside. The trio never had a chance. Police were everywhere. The place was surrounded. Barry hid, but detectives knew two people had gone inside while King waited in the car. Seems police had received a tip about the unlocked door, too. Barry soon gave himself up and lost all he had worked so hard to accomplish. His education continued at boot camp. Caught red-handed, Barry coughed up all the details about the botched crime in his statement to police. Barry got a plea bargain out of the deal. Tight-lipped King and his co-worker went to court. Despite Barry's cooperation, he and King received the exact same punishment. Ninety days. Returned to Jasper for second chances, King's father helped both young men get jobs working for Louisiana Pacific. Barry stayed. After two weeks, King quit. Barry discovered King was not only lazy, but that the friend he once admired over the Citizens Band radio couldn't stay out of trouble. More problems eventually forced King to go live with his sister, Inviter. It gave Barry a chance to think about all the mistakes he'd made. Soon, a pretty young woman had Barry thinking about other things, including love and commitment. Christy Marcantel was a beauty. Not only did she hear it often enough from passing strangers, but she also had the trophies to prove it. Miss Newton County saw something in Barry that made her give him the time of day. With long auburn hair and doe eyes, the beauty queen knew she could wrap the rough house around her finger. Aware of each other for years, they finally had their first official date. So smitten was Barry, he informed his probation officer in 1995 that he wanted to marry Marcantel. Sean came in here one day and told us Christy was going to be in the Miss Texas pageant. William Sparks chuckles. Sparks thought Marcantel's presence might calm the rough tide. A lot of guys I see, they slow down when they find a serious relationship. Not Sean. King kept coming around. Barry had finally secured the love of an attractive woman who could help build him up and restore the lost confidence. With Mark Contell in his life, Barry's hard edges did soften a bit, but the two were not immune to arguments about his philandering ways and bad boy tantrums. For a little woman, Mark Contell could loudly discuss, toe-to-toe -to -toe with Barry, and stand her ground. As the disagreements added up, Barry continued to make time for extracurricular hobbies that included chasing women and riding bulls at the rodeo. Barry was enjoying a full life of being in love, holding down multiple jobs and joyriding on back roads. To avoid trouble and jail, Barry tried to stick to the terms of his boot camp release. Sparks was there to help. I remember telling him not once, but several times, to stay away from Bill King. Barry saw King one final time after a scheduled meeting with his probation officer. King came barreling up to Barry on the sidewalk, desperate for a ride. To Barry, he seemed in a hurry, like he was running from somebody. Barry was trying to keep his nose clean. He left King to fend for himself and returned to work. Shortly afterward, Barry heard King had been caught and sent to state prison for parole violations. For a time, Barry was free of King. But then the first letter from prison came. He showed it to his good friend, Heath Johnson. Barry had no interest in responding. Then the second letter arrived. By the time the third piece of mail from Tennessee Colony was delivered, King was advising Barry to stay white and using prison slang like bro, something Barry didn't like or understand. He threw all four of King's letters in the trash. One day at work, Ronald King came to see Barry with a camera. He suddenly snapped a picture and said it was for Bill. Since Barry would not write back, King got his father to send the next best thing to prison, a picture of his good friend. Something happened to John William King at Beto One. He will not discuss it. Just hours after he was processed, assigned a number and cell, prison records indicate King was involved in some type of scuffle. 
speculation persists that King was beaten, sexually assaulted, or both. Whatever greeting he received from the infamous Beto welcome wagon, it is generally agreed that King's attackers were black. Not long after that first day, King met and drifted toward Lawrence Russell Brewer, who offered him protection in the Confederate Knights of America. Months earlier, when Brewer first arrived, he was checked by two Hispanic gang members. All the inmates in Brewer's cell block had been ordered to sit down on benches in the break room or they would be punished by guards. Blacks took one bench. Hispanics occupied another. The remaining whites would not let Brewer sit with him on the last bench, so he was forced to lean against a wall. It became his permanent position for two days, whenever his cell block was allowed out for recreation. Asked whether he would fight or ride, Brewer refused both, but acknowledged his preference for a beating rather than give up money or sexual favors, which is how most gang members check the strength or weakness of a new inmate. Whites, or Woods, who watched the exchange, liked what they saw in the tough little man and decided to invite Brewer to join the CKA. Fearful of what might be waiting around the next corner, Brewer instantly agreed. After a written document was signed to show loyalty, Brewer cut his thumb and pressed his bloody right print to seal the agreement. In the oath of the rebel soldiers, Brewer solemnly swore before Almighty God and these clansmen here assembled that he would bear true allegiance to the sacred principles of Aryan racial supremacy. Four paragraphs later, there is even a shred of understanding for lost Anglos. To my racial brothers and sisters from among the white community who will hate and persecute me because they have been so cruelly brainwashed, I, Lawrence Russell Brewer, pledge my patience and love. Among the 12 bylaws adopted by the CKA is the following. Members will not socialize with mud race. Near the top of the list was a rule that may have been the catalyst for many inmates who joined. Homosexuality will not be tolerated. A few months later, when King arrived at Beto, Brewer understood much of what King was going through as the newest minority on a racially segregated cell block. One side of Beto was well over 50% African American. The White Brothers, or Woods, who stood up to intimidators, were the only family that could help Brewer survive and make it out alive. The CKA even meant more to him than his own young family, a Hispanic wife and their son, both of whom he would readily deny. With his rank as exalted Cyclops, Brewer secretly recruited Texas rebel soldiers for the CKA. John William King made the 12th member. Chapter 5 On the approach to the site where King and Brewer met, cows munch grass near blocks of hay on the open range. Pigs are fattened for the slaughterhouse and returned in white packages as pork chops and sausage. A few horses, in excellent condition, are kept and ready to mount at the drop of a hat. Trained hunting dogs are cared for as well as any human who calls this place home. A thriving industrial area employs an endless supply of men who have metal sign skills. There is abundant work available for those willing, and it is extended without the confines of pollution, heavy traffic, or federal taxes. Except for the occasional odor of manure, the air is so sweet few can resist riding with the windows down to inhale the invigorating freshness. Almost 20,000 acres consist of rolling hills, thick woods, and prime soil where anything will grow, including a vast array of tomatoes, sweet corn, squash, watermelon, and okra. Rich crop colors dot the landscape with green, yellow, and red. The sight of so many black faces in the field conjures up images of plantation life. Nearly all the Anderson County acreage sits less than 10 miles from a one-stop sign town known as Tennessee Colony, Texas, where more than 13,000 residents live in close quarters. They are mostly urban inmates, divided into five prison units of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. Men of all races work together on several projects, including a pest control facility, a farm shop where hay is processed, a swine plant, 
and a nursery. Four of the five units, Caulfield, Gurney, Powledge, and Michael, are located together, but separately run. The last facility, Beto 1, roughly consumes 3,900 acres alone, and is home to more than 3,000 inmates, or, as many in the system refer to them, offenders. Except for these massive boarding houses, and the reason thousands must stay in them, almost any Texan would be proud to own the lush, green property. Technically, taxpayers do own it, under the guardianship of the state of Texas. Approximately 100 miles from Dallas, I wind down a paved but narrow two-lane farm-to-market road. Houses are few and far between, with one or two mansions that do not seem to belong. There is but one church on FM 645, which very much resembles FM 1408 in Jasper, the same farm-to-market road that leads to Huff Creek. The grassy parking lot at the Faith Assembly is empty. Four or five miles beyond, everything a visitor needs to know about Tennessee Colony, Texas, is posted at the town's primary intersection. On one corner is the Tennessee Colony Recreation Center. Across the street sits a busy Exxon station with two pumps and a general store. A bright green sign with easy-to-read directions to all five prison units cannot be missed. The arrow to Beto points straight ahead. Deeper, into Anderson County, approximately three miles from the town square activity, is another asphalt road that leads to a huge facility off in the distance. Guard towers loom high above a cluster of ugly flat buildings surrounded by coils of barbed wire. On the left side of the road, leading up to the entrance, are small sets of military barracks that appear to be wrapped with the dull side of aluminum foil. There is no movement, no sign of life. It is impossible to believe that anyone, let alone 3,200 men, calls this home. Things are quiet and still. Across the street on the right side, even plant and animal life in the woods appears muted. Up ahead on the left is the turn that leads to the entryway, where a large wooden sign greets visitors. Welcome to the George Beto unit of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice as if the entrance leads to a wildlife preserve or picnic grounds. Two uniformed guards are posted. They demand to know the nature of all visits. Inside the armed gates and past the entry sit a neat row of red brick homes, three single-story duplexes on the right. These are for staff. The first house belongs to the Beto warden. The second is occupied by another warden. The other property is empty. At home... The warden may relax, but he is never free of work, thanks to a diagonal vista of the prison. Unsupervised males in white pants and white shirts roam around, the first sign of inmate life at Beto. They are men on a mission, mostly black men, easy to spot in the white prison-issued standard uniforms. They walk fast, entering and departing a small frame building that could be for equipment, recreation, or living quarters for trustees. There are no obvious guards who monitor them, but a trained shotgun is probably pointed in their direction at all times from one of the two towers located nearby. Several wear matching white caps. There is almost no visor to cover faces from the blistering hot sun. One black inmate is on a small tractor. He rides back and forth in straight rows over the grass. He wears a satisfied smile. A corrections officer is posted at the designated sign-in area. The entire front portion of Beto is mostly gray, like concrete, and flat, with a mile of open windows that appear uniformly measured at 12 inches. Without a photo identification card, no entry to the prison unit is allowed. A large sign instructs families of the offenders what is allowed in and what is not. Purses never go beyond this area. Neither do cameras or tape recorders. Phone calls are made to verify visits. An inmate, possibly from the group of trustees, watches in silence as the corrections officer receives official confirmation to open this mysterious world to an outsider. The handsome black prisoner barely nods in kind to the slight tip of the head given. 
On the FM road that leads into Bido, there is a sign that warns all to make sure their car doors are locked. Hitchhikers may be escaping inmates. Opportunities for potential getaway or escape must be tempting and seem tremendous with all the thick woods and delivery trucks that stop here on a weekly basis. A loud buzz indicates the okay to push open the first electronic gate, a chain-link fence with a door carved out of the 12-foot-high metal barrier. On the gate, a voice yells out. It must be pushed all the way closed before the second fence door, only a few feet away, automatically hums, then opens. In addition to the dainty flower petals of yellow and purple that give Beto's front yard some variety, there are brilliant reds and blues on a dozen windows on the right side of the building. The mirage of blended colors and backward shapes indicates these are stained glass windows, the prison chapel. Administrative offices at Beto line the right side after the entry, while a reception area takes up a part of the left. Another larger area is just beyond this one, complete with vending machines of chips, candy, and soda. Visitors wait here for permission to move forward. The warden's office is the third door on the right. Inside is someone who looks more like a retired ball player than a man responsible for the lives of 3,200 inmates. The warden is all business, no doubt a woodsman on days off. A small smile disappears from his face when he learns one of the posted rules has been broken. A forbidden micro-cassette recorder, even in the hands of a rookie visitor, is not tolerable. Wearing a gray shirt and starched khaki pants, a young corrections officer is assigned the task of tour guide. The warden takes the recorder. Down the hall, seconds away from the administrative area, is the first of many locked doors. On the other side is the heartbeat of this entire unit, a place known as the control picket. The centrally located area houses all the keys and monitors radio traffic everywhere in Beto. It is a monumental task. All use of force equipment is here. Everything necessary to quell a prison riot or ruckus is within reach for officers trained to gather at the hub. Beyond the very next locked door is a foreign world to most law-abiding citizens, a world that assaults ears and other senses before there is one look at life inside Beto 1. The sign reads, Security is never convenient. All corrections officers understand it as the rite of passage to access beyond the somewhat secure control picket area. They are four words that serve as a wake-up call to personnel that it is time to leave worldly distractions where they belong, outside. This work is hard. It is dangerous. You never let your guard down. Never let the inmates see you sweat. Never turn your back. Suddenly, the door is wide open. It is time to follow the guide inside. Beto is fashioned as one long hallway with a series of locked gates and iron bars. The whir of many voices, a few loud, mostly muffled, sound distinctly like one man. On the other side of the control picket, there is not only a feeling of vulnerability, but of exposure. My sole form of identification is taken away and left behind at the 220 desk located at the control picket, except to the female corrections officer who knows name, address, and Texas town of residence, a feeling of dangerous anonymity behind the walls of Beto is unsettling. But the CO, corrections officer, knows who to notify in case anything happens. And from the puzzled look, she probably wonders why anyone might need a tour of the unit named for Dr. Walking George Beto, a former warden who won respect for his reputation of spontaneously walking and talking with inmates and staff. His face looms large from the photo in the foyer. At chow time, dozens of unshackled men are out of their cells and in the hallway, which is the length of three football fields, with the control picket situated in the middle of two monster sides appropriately named North and South. Before any offender is allowed to march to the mess hall, he is searched. Metal gates that are normally locked are briefly left open for inmates to file through as they exit or enter for meals. They are fed at intervals by the various wings. It takes some time to feed all 3,200 men. 
One of the most intimidating things about Beto is its sheer numbers. It does not take a calculator to figure that white shirts outnumber the gray ones 50 to 1. Men everywhere move, and as they do, they make little or no obvious eye contact with their foreign observer. They are, at certain times, let out of human cages, without wrist bracelets, to eat, talk, mop, and socialize. In the barber shop, all chairs are full. Four inmates cut hair. As the tour continues, a sea of faceless black and brown men pass by close enough for introductions and handshakes. Young and observant, the faces of a few white men who congregate together flash like a shuffled deck of cards. They, too, look down or straight ahead. Others take a peek when they believe it will not be noted. It is hard to miss such a sharp, bright contrast to the drab gray and cotton white. At the commissary, there is a long line. Men have but one or two opportunities during any given day to purchase items with money from their Beto trust funds. It is hard-earned cash, deposited by friends and family on the outside. Most offenders are allowed to spend no more than $60 during any given period, which is usually about two weeks. Others, depending on their level of custody, are allowed to spend as little as $20 on various snacks and toiletries. Exchanges occur through a small window where cash is accepted and items pushed back through. A dark black man grabs two loaves of white bread as soon as he pays. He moves quickly to place the sacred purchase in a dirty white bag with a drawstring. All inmates are allowed such a possession to shop with, or to keep their personal items stored in. Many carry them everywhere to avoid theft. The six-year veteran responsible for safe passage calmly describes Beto as a small city. Indeed. The resemblance is uncanny, with the possible exception that this vibrant community is minus the normal presence of women and children. No doubt this unnatural lifestyle leads to a great deal of stress and pent-up frustration, or high testosterone clashes. The warden has no statistical information to back up complaints that indicate the heavily populated north is the more troublesome area of this little community. Fewer inmates are housed in the south, so it may be an easier place to do hard time. It certainly seems to many observers that fewer violent incidents occur here. The southern sector is also where the chapel is located, a tranquil place, its painted tower of green and brown, strikingly similar to a guard watchtower, features a superimposed male figure with outstretched hands, pierced by nails. The palms of his hands are marked by crimson stains. It is the Christ, inviting, suffering, loving, and forgiving. Artwork done by Beto inmates. Inside the sanctuary are twelve windows, the ones that can be seen by approaching visitors outside. Not authentic stained glass, the beautiful windows are nonetheless symbolic of each apostle's life. Rows of ordinary worship chairs are slanted for the best view of the podium and stage. Though located in the southern section of the building, the chapel is a peaceful centerpiece of the unit, with easy access for inmates who choose to honor their faith. When not used for holy purposes, a stage behind the pulpit serves as an outlet for creativity. Hidden off to the left, just behind the makeshift curtain, are a set of drums, a piano, and a guitar used for special programs. Any solemnity at Beto is solely reserved for this time and space. At the height of chow time, more noise and more men fill the long hall. The far end in the south is known as PRTC, a pre-release treatment center for offenders who are six months away from going home. The idea is to counsel inmates about to be sent back into the free world and help them understand what it will take to become productive members of society. Known gang members live in F-wing, administrative segregation. The most incorrigible inmates in the prison population are housed in the administrative segregation wing and classified by three numbers according to behavior. A level three on ADSEG has more restrictions than a level one or level two, even down to the amount of money he is allowed to spend. The door that leads to administrative segregation remains locked at all times.
All the ADSEG offenders stay in single cells that have a second set of black security panels across the first set of bars. They serve as square slots through which trays of food can be passed. Each six by eight foot living space is equipped with sink and toilet. A large industrial size fan strategically placed on each floor circulates what passes for a cool breeze. It is uncomfortable. Eight months of the year in Texas fall between warm and hell. Inmates know the only areas of the prison that have air conditioning are the administrative offices, the medical facility, the school, and a handful of off-limit spots. It takes more time and manpower to individually serve meals through slots for level one, two, and three prisoners. Usually, ADSEG designees get only one hour out of their cells each day for recreation or showers. Every inmate must be strip-searched and cuffed before they are allowed outside the cell. An officer must accompany them to the showers or break room and stay with them until it is time to return them to F-Wing. Back on the main artery, the north-south football field, it is busy as ever with more long lines at the only store in the vicinity, the prison commissary. A posted handwritten advertisement lists available stock. Band-Aids are 75 cents apiece. If an inmate wants a no-name laxative, it will cost a dollar. Fixident is a whopping 425. There are no bargains or coupons to help drive down the purchase price. Money is a luxury that can produce daily struggles to maintain prized prison trust funds. While a few states pay inmate wages, Texas does not. Through an honest day's work in factories, fields, or offices, inmates earn credit for good time, which can be used to trim sentences. Very few Texans support the idea that prison is a paid job. It is enough that taxpayers must pay for three hots and a cot. An almost exact replica of housing and services is found in the northern section of the building. By several credible accounts, Beto's north side is notoriously violent. Beto, like a few others, is known as a gladiator unit because the average age of most inmates is ridiculously young, mid-twenties. The dubious distinction is also a warning. Gladiators either fight because they must or because they like to. In some cases, Beto gladiators are as young as seniors in high school. In a few rare instances, there are inmates near 30. For the most part, they are young Hellcats who hold life to be of little value, either the victims or their own, and believe they must fight for respect to protect and preserve what they have or to take what belongs to someone else. Not all fill the bill. Those who do not quickly learn what is expected by the state and the inmates who run the prison. Back out in the sunshine of Anderson County, there is a kind of exalted relief. Above the brilliant silence, the noise of 3,000 voices is clearly heard, along with key clicks that secure metal bars. But there is another sound that I hear which these men cannot. The motorized hum of outside gates that offer precious freedom. On the way out of the prison complex, I notice a homemade sign in the woods. Justice. Swiftly, fairly, and evenly. This is where John William King met Lawrence Russell Brewer. Up to three dozen new or suspected gang members in prison are identified in an average month. The corrections officer flatly states. Then, in a resigned tone, the public has no idea of the level of gang activity throughout the prison system. Texas is not just any prison system in the United States. It is one of the largest in the nation. Close to 150,000 inmates live in more than 100 units that make up the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. The TDCJ is in a unique position to reinvent itself as a model system for others with similar woes. But progress is a slow and tedious climb from the basement, where Texas corrections officers suffer from low morale because their pay ranks 46th in the United States for those who do this kind of work. Starting pay to risk their lives every day is about $18,000 a year. Such salaries and work conditions often attract 20-something high school graduates who will get only four weeks of training to prepare for brutal 12-hour shifts. 
other statistics are even more sobering and dangerous. According to the TDCJ Security Threat Management Office, there are more than 5,000 confirmed gang members in 11 security risk groups. Nearly 9,000 other inmates are suspected of allegiance or membership. Among the groups, which organize mostly by race, are some names familiar in the outside world. The Mexican Mafia is the largest. They have over 1,400 known gang members, and even more are suspected of support or membership. 500 inmates are confirmed members of the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas. An additional 800 may be secretly affiliated. The Crips are the largest black gang behind prison walls. Only a little more than 500 prisoners have been identified as gang members. Their real strength may lie in the fact that 2,400 others are suspected members who pledge life and loyalty to their cause. No one knows the exact date that the problem of racist gangs first came to the attention of corrections officials, but one man, Salvador Sammy Buentello, has a pretty good idea. Several years ago, an inmate told Buentello a fascinating story about a prison gang in another state. I sent him back to his cell and started making phone calls. I spoke to California officials. The more I looked, I started to see that some inmate violence was being perpetrated by gangs. It was the early 1980s. Buentello and fellow employee Terry Pels began to monitor different individuals and talk to them about their affiliations and beliefs. Since most of the gangs are Hispanic, being bilingual was certainly a help for Buentello, who is now an assistant director for the department that manages security threat groups. Pels, who rose to the rank of assistant warden, is now a criminal justice consultant. By 1985, one of the most murderous years in the history of the Texas prison system, 25 inmates were killed by other inmates. Buentello and a handful of others could see a dramatic link between the race of the victims and some of the slayings. Before the year ended, officials took drastic measures to stop random inmate attacks and planned hits. Texas was first in the country to implement administrative segregation, a tool to separate and individually house offenders who have a propensity to disciplinary problems, those who require protection, and those who are security risks. Gang members, at some point, may fit all three categories, but most are placed in ADSEG because they belong to a security risk group. Buentello's laid-back personality makes him a natural for his job. A kind of liaison between wardens and inmates, he will meet and identify racist gang members before they are ever issued a unit and number. First, prisoners are placed in a diagnostic area in Huntsville, where they are put through an evaluation process, medical screening, family background, and other required procedures. Information is consolidated, and a determination is made on which unit an inmate will be sent to. Through this lengthy process, security managers are able to document an offender's gang history or suspected involvement. As Buentello learned in his informal investigation, a group known as the Aryan Brotherhood can be traced to its prison roots at the California Department of Corrections in the early 1960s. Ex-convicts and inmates from San Quentin with white supremacist beliefs demonstrated their take-no-prisoners style with a series of dangerous bank robberies and high-profile armored car heists. Copycat prison groups immediately sprung up around the country. Buentello soon confirmed that the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas was established after a group of inmates requested permission from California to form a chapter. Reportedly, permission was denied, but organizers went ahead with plans anyway to form the ABT. Eight of the 11 security risk groups in Texas originated behind prison walls. Many, including the Aryan Brotherhood, the Texas Syndicate, and the Mexican Mafia, once lived by a particularly disturbing clause in their constitutions known as blood in, blood out. In order to join the group, a potential member had to spill the blood of an enemy. Blood out literally meant there was no way out other than death to the member seeking to exit the group. Today, it is harder to enforce the blood in, blood out old school policy, a fact that does not hurt recruitment. 
According to Buentello, several risk groups have ranking structures composed of captains, lieutenants, sergeants, soldiers, and a list of other well-defined positions. During its heyday, the ABT even had a steering committee that controlled illegal activity in and out of prison. No matter their race, almost all groups are motivated by control of the lucrative drug and sex trades through means of violence, extortion, and intimidation. Another identified group, the Bloods, came into existence when founders Sylvester Scott and Vincent Owens formed the Compton Pyrus, aptly named because the gang originated on West Pyru Street in Compton, California. Initially, the Bloods developed to protect themselves economically from the Crips, their traditional street rivals. Soon afterward, recognition given to the Compton Pyrus rapidly spread across the country and other Blood chapters were formed. Bloods, who identify with the color red, are one of the only prison gangs that can trace its beginning back to the streets, as opposed to prisons. Texas officials can confirm only 150 known members in prison. Close to a thousand other inmates have suspected ties to the Bloods. If security threat groups in Texas account for less than 4% of the prison population, and another known 6% are aiding them, how can such a small combined force control the other 90%? The search for answers has netted a varied set of opinions, but there is agreement that inmate violence plays a fundamental role. Easy targets are first made submissive, then turned into whatever is needed in the prison hierarchy. Prostitutes, drug runners, bodyguards, etc. 50% of all Texas inmates are poor. As in the free world, they need money to survive. One way is through extortion. If an inmate is lucky enough to have a family member or friend deposit his allowed $60 to use every two weeks, he may be forced to spend all or part of it on protection. If that inmate refuses, daily beatings might help change his mind. Another persuasive method is the threat of prostitution. Inmates regularly use weaker prisoners for sexual services they can sell to those who have ready cash. A prisoner who does not fight off sexual advances is quickly labeled a hoe and passed around. Sometimes he is even sold from one gang to the next. Even more threatening is the welcoming committee that almost always pays a visit to gang rape the new arrival. At least once, a terrified nonviolent offender requested that medical services sew his anus shut. Another lucrative option is an inmate partnership with a dissatisfied guard easily tempted by the lure of extra money. Texas employs more than 23,000 corrections officers who are, for the most part, hard-working men and women with pride in the uniform they wear. They do not see themselves as guards. That term applies to corrupt personnel guilty of participation in illegal activity like smuggling drugs, tobacco, alcohol, and pornography inside for offenders to sell. Over the years, guards have been fired for lewd behavior with inmates, physical abuse, supplying contraband, and secret affiliation in some of the very gangs they are paid to keep tabs on. According to Kelsey Kaufman, a national scholar and leading expert on prisons, Corruption is a far greater problem among corrections officers than most officials will acknowledge. Inmate activity is there because of a wink and a nod from corrections staff. Kaufman, herself once a corrections officer, calls American jails and prisons the most racially divisive institutions in the country. Think about what you know about race relations in America, Kaufman urges. If you take your most desperate African-American males and put them under the total dominance of white-run prisons, what do you expect to happen? Indeed, there is no quick fix, especially when evidence points to seven different states where prison guards have worn KKK insignia or posted swastikas to alert others of open recruitment. In Florida, Dozens of black corrections officers are part of two class action lawsuits alleging discrimination. One black officer found the following hunting license in his office. Open season on porch monkeys. Daily kills limited to 10. Terry Pels is also aware of state prison systems that have problems with corrections personnel. 
in Ohio. Some of the guards are members of the Aryan Brotherhood. Pell says some racist guards stage fights between selected inmates. The internal strife caused by division among the ranks can wreak havoc in the life of a corrections officer. Experts say such officers have a higher divorce and suicide rate than those in some metro police departments. Kaufman, author of Prison Officers and Their World, uses her doctoral dissertation from Harvard to make the point that racist institutions continue to be the South's response to the end of slavery. In rural areas, where the prison staff is almost all white and they have very little cultural training or awareness, all the stereotypes about black people produce racism. Kaufman says it's not fair to the rural communities or the urban inmates who end up at the mercy of an insensitive white environment. According to Kaufman, a number of employees, low-level as well as corrections officers, do stand up to say the behavior is wrong. Some have even gone to the FBI. They are quickly singled out for harassment, threats, insults, and other forms of abuse. Many are forced to resign or seek transfers to other facilities. For fear of retaliation, many no longer feel it is worth it to speak out, especially when decent officers are cursed, attacked, maimed, and sometimes raped by angry inmates who lash out at a secret system of racial favorites. Kaufman believes a vital difference can be made by training and hiring qualified minority personnel from urban areas. But prisons have a tough time recruiting. Not many city dwellers want to live in the boondocks where units are located. Further, the idea of living with indifferent or racist neighbors does not encourage minorities to pursue such jobs. Dr. Richard Watkins is one of the few black senior wardens in the Texas prison system. He helped to spearhead an effort to have his unit named for an African-American with a letter to then Governor Ann Richards. He smiles broadly. Reverend Holliday was a community activist from this area. Holliday is only one of two units in the system named for a black man. Watkins believes if Texas is going to house so many black offenders, officials should also be willing to find positive black men after whom to name some of the units. The native Texan is not shy about speaking his mind. Watkins has had his life threatened four times twice by white staffers who worked for him. Because of his zero-tolerance policy on racist gang activity among corrections personnel, Watkins is known to ferret out troublemakers, like the rebellious officer who once wore a Confederate flag bandana on his head to work. Others remain silent sympathizers. They have gone underground to avoid detection. Of the United States District Judge who put Texas prisons under federal oversight, William Wayne Justice, Watkins does not hesitate to say, Justice is my personal hero. He forced the state to do what it should have done all along, employees to do their work and inmates to serve their time. Others do not share his view that the entire system needs to be overhauled. Critics blame Justice for destroying one of the most well-run prison systems in America. Three major changes, all of them set in motion by legal action, forever changed the face of Texas prisons. In the transition, these sanctioned alterations also helped create an ideal setting for the rise of racist gangs. The backlash started with a 1972 civil rights lawsuit filed by an inmate named David Ruiz. In the late 70s, alleged constitutional violations were aired in Houston court. In 1980, Judge Justice found that confinement in Texas prisons did constitute cruel and unusual punishment based on several factors, including brutality by guards, excessive force at the hands of building tenders, inmate guards, uncontrolled physical abuse among offenders, and substandard medical care. Some prison officials are still bitter about decades of federal intervention, but admit there have been improvements in staff and health care under justice. Another lawsuit, Lamar v. Caulfield, forced integration in prison housing. Historically, Texas has always segregated inmates by race. All offenders, black, white, and Hispanic, would be placed on one cell block with only members of their own race. The policy of segregation ensured against any serious interaction between the races. 
Even the workforce on prison farms was divided by ethnicity. In 1979, Lamar changed everything. Offenders were not happy about that Lamar decision, and it caused a lot of racial tension, Sammy Buentello recalls. When officials complied, the results were a boost to security risk groups. That's the ruling, what the gangs used to actually recruit. Whites found themselves outnumbered on newly integrated cell blocks four to one. An imminent shift in power played upon the fears of those who perceived their status and positions of privilege in permanent danger. Reactions included more militant posturing as well as resentment over a new world order. Another legal decision paved the road that would ultimately end what some viewed as preferential treatment based on race. Until 1979, black inmates had to run to the very fields where backbreaking labor was required of them. By comparison, Hispanics rode to work in trailers with backless wooden benches to sit on. Whites had separate trailers that not only included places to sit, but also support from backboards they could rest against. Black men saw inmates designated building tenders as little more than white overseers on the master's plantation. Others believed the inmate guards were all institutional snitches who funneled information to prison officials about cell block activity. After Judge Justice ordered wardens to end the practice of already outlawed tenders who technically worked for the state as unpaid guards, the prison system was ripe for a new kind of racism. Hundreds of corrections officers were hired to replace the ousted tenders. Millions of dollars were earmarked for new prisons. Medical services slowly improved. But integration wreaked havoc on white offenders who had little or no experience with black inmates. The proverbial upper hand was quickly seized in Texas prisons. All the rapid changes opened the door for a new set of invisible building tenders. Prison gang members. Black inmates suddenly found themselves in a new position of strength in the early 1980s. Many felt it was payback time. Their Anglo counterparts did not appreciate what they perceived as daily arrivals from the streets who had attitude and total disrespect for white inmates. Because the state-mandated power structure in prison collapsed, a campaign of abuse and hatred materialized through inmate correspondence and secret meetings. Against this legislative backdrop, the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas was born. The roots of the ABT have been traced extensively and documented in the fall-winter 1991 edition of the Prison Journal. According to researchers Mary Pells, James W. Marquot, and C. Terry Pells, whites who felt persecuted by defense mechanisms like the Mandingo Warriors or the Self-Defense Family two black groups that organized in response to ABT tactics and extremist beliefs, found solace and support with like-minded whites who would risk life and limb to protect them. Inmate killings spun out of control. One black was stabbed over accusations of hogging white inmates. Hogging refers to sexual exploitation or physical abuse. Another black inmate was killed by a white gang member who set out to prove his loyalty to his gang. And the list went on and on. Prior to the initial justice ruling, annual figures for inmate murders were single digit. In a matter of months, they tripled. In 1984 and 1985, suspected responsibility for a quarter of 52 inmate slayings were squarely blamed on the ABT. As their reputation grew, more whites wanted in. ABT members became known far and wide as mad dogs or crazy motherfuckers who took their beliefs seriously. Watchdog groups list the original Aryan Brotherhood, San Quentin, as one of the most violent prison gangs in the country. A part of the ABT creed offers some insight into the philosophy of its members. Death holds no fear. Vengeance will be his through his brothers still here. Prison officials fought back with their administrative segregation policy. Through communication and education, they armed themselves with as much information as possible about the ABT and other groups. Among a batch of confiscated written documents, authorities recovered a publication that outlined physically specific details on how to stab a black to ensure death rather than injury. It included a warning. 
The smell of fresh human blood can be overpowering, but killing is like having sex. The first time is not so rewarding, but it gets better and better with practice, especially when one remembers that it's a holy cause. John is an inmate who came to prison straight from the streets. Living fast and hard, the teenager soon found himself convicted of first-degree murder. There was no way out and no second chance. He had to pay for the life he snuffed out with a life in prison. Nearly 20 years later, John savors every lesson he has learned about survival. For a huge chunk of that time, John was proud to be a member of the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas, a group he joined so he could have a family in prison. Basically, I joined the group because it was everybody helping each other out at first, John recalls. But things quickly changed from the simple daily discussions about what the group hoped to accomplish to racially charged dialogue. Still, John stayed connected because the ABT did offer help to others. Somebody didn't have any family in the world. We made them feel welcome. It was a recruitment strategy that worked. Gang leaders knew if they flat out told potential recruits that they were a bunch of racists doing drugs and arranging hits or participating in illegal activity, there weren't going to be a lot of folks signing up. John claims he had few clues about the group's larger objectives because he never saw signs that the ABT was solely based on illegal activity with a racial slant. It started turning racial around 1986, and that's one of the reasons I got discouraged with it. By 1989, John notes, everyone, all the gangs, wanted to be racial. Though the groups align themselves racially while incarcerated, John is a firm believer that once members return to the outside world, they either drop or disassociate themselves from beliefs adopted to survive. ABT members are down with a cause as long as they are in prison, he says, but when released, they forget all about everybody inside. Gone is the promise to financially and emotionally support brother inmates with money and letters. Some do send money back or share profits from criminal activity. But John never heard from any member in the free world when he was still in the Brotherhood and has his own theory on why. The hatred is a survival thing, where everybody puts the white race down or puts other races down. Naturally, everybody's going to band together with their own race for protection. Such behavior continues to play out in prison on a daily basis. John says it's a fact of incarcerated life. Oh, it's widespread with events happening in each unit. The ex-ABT member chalks up much of his experience to youth and ignorance about other races. I wish I had never got in it because it ruined a lot of things for me personally. There were things that happened that I regret but couldn't stop. John refuses to say what those things are, but he was a member during the bloody prison uprising in 1984-85 when there were reported murders at several units. Like the racist tattoo on his right arm, John's regrets are permanent. With his expressionless face wet with perspiration, John continues, If everybody respected each other, not trying to run each other's lives and control everything, it might be better. John reveals his tattoo, then quickly covers it up with a short sleeve prison white. A lot of people do get them, tattoos, for protection. Though tattoos are prohibited by Texas prison policy, inmates like John are able to get dozens of tattoos while locked up. Some are strictly for protection. Others send an indisputable message. If a white guy has three lightning bolts and a swastika on his neck, Chances are he will not be approached by blacks for casual conversation. That's known as an obvious message. There are even tattoos solely designed to provide protection from sexual predators. Some men, especially Hispanics, take an artistic approach to avoid being raped by another inmate, or worse, a group of inmates. Since the overwhelming number of rapes are committed from behind, a few Hispanic inmates have tattoos of the Virgin Mary etched on their backs. An attacker might hesitate in a fit of conscience over the sacred symbol. While a picture of the Madonna can give pause, a tattoo of a voluptuous female on an inmate's back sends an entirely different signal to a predator. Every offender, even those who choose sexually suggestive tattoos, 
must do what he can to survive one more day in the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. The corrections officers charged with watching over the inmates feel the same. Both sides agree that all most people want is a little respect. Without it, prison is about control. Those with power exert it over the powerless. They are the inmates who decide what television programs will be watched in the break room, who has to pay extortion money, which inmates are worthy to be in their racist gangs. The 10% in control offer protection, dole out beatings, and battle over the sex and drug trades. The other 90% try to survive. Experts say the whole prison environment means an offender, violent or nonviolent, whether he wants to or not, has to socialize to stay alive. Sometimes he joins a gang. When it was first erroneously reported by some media outlets that John William King, Lawrence Russell Brewer, and Sean Allen Berry were possibly members of the Aryan Brotherhood, all hell broke loose in Texas prisons. Blacks were very incensed, Sammy Buentello recalls. They started to retaliate against white inmates, and then we started to have more racial incidents directed at the ABT, he says. Aryan Brotherhood of Texas members were also upset that anyone would dare believe that is how they would behave in the free world. The ABT defended itself against accusations and attacks until a tit-for-tat situation developed. As Buentello began a dialogue with certain individuals, he was convinced the dragging murder of James Byrd Jr. did not fit the style or profile of what the Aryan Brotherhood is usually accused or convicted of. According to other officials who agree, the ABT would not be eager to do anything that would bring international shame, wide attention, or that particular kind of dishonor to the group. When they recruit, they make sure of the backgrounds and personalities of the people they are recommending, Buentello says. The Aryan Brotherhood has never been a group any white man could just join. It is more discreet. He must have a sponsor, a certified member who can vouch for his character. John William King dreamed of being a member of the Aryan Brotherhood, but they are very selective. King may not have lived up to their list of high standards, which could explain why he settled for a lesser known clique, the Confederate Knights of America. A few months after his release from Beto, King finally had the satisfaction that Aryan brothers everywhere took notice. Unfortunately for him, so did the rest of the world.